Hi, this is Mrs. Chavez. Today we're moving into um, chapter 25, and that's the Industrial Revolution. It runs from 1700 to 1900. You know, in the U.S., France and Latin America, they had political revolutions, and a lot of them, and these brought in new governments. But there was a new type of revolution that was taking place that was transforming the way people worked, and that was the Industrial Revolution. So today we're starting with section one, the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. So the Agricultural Revolution actually preceded the Industrial Revolution. This was the third Agricultural Revolution. In 1700, small farms covered England's landscape. These wealthy landowners began to buy up much of the land that the village farmers had once worked. The large landowners dramatically improved farming methods, and these innovations amounted to what we call an agricultural revolution. The enclosure movement uh, began with these farmers. Now, the enclosure movement had two important results. First, landowners tried new agricultural methods, and second, large landowners uh, forced these small farmers to become tenant farmers or to give up farming and move to the cities. After buying up the land of the village farmers, these wealthy landowners enclosed their lands. That's what we call the enclosure movement. They enclosed them with fences and hedges, and this increase in their land holdings enabled them to cultivate larger fields. With these large fields, called enclosures, landowners experimented with more productive seeding and harvesting methods to boost crop yields. These new methods of farming greatly increased um, crop yields and production. Jethro Tull, there's a picture from there with a seed drill, um, he saw that the usual way of sowing seeds by gather, scattering it across the ground was kind of wasteful. Uh, a lot of the seeds didn't uh, take root, and he solved this problem with an invention called the seed drill. It allowed the farmers to sow the seeds in well-spaced rows at specific depths. A larger share of the seeds took root, and crop yields um, were also increased. Another method, the crop rotation. This process was an improvement upon an older method of crop rotation that they called the medieval three-field system. This new method, um, in one year, a farmer might plant a field with wheat, which exhausted the soil nutrients, and the next year, he planted a root crop, such as turnips, to restore the nutrients. This was followed by barley and then clover. Another um, new method of farming was with animal husbandry. Robert Bakewell increased his sheep meat output by allowing only his best sheep to breed. The average weight for lambs climbed from 18 pounds to 50 pounds in one year. Also, all this improved method of farming also improve, uh, increases the population. An increasing population boosted demand for food and goods, such as cloth, and as farmers lost their land to large enclosed farms, many became factory workers. So what was the Industrial Revolution? Well, the Industrial Revolution really refers to the greatly increased output of machine-made goods that began in England in the middle 1700s. Before the Industrial Revolution, people were creating all their textiles and clothing at home by hand. Then machines began to do this, and other jobs too. Soon the Industrial Revolution spread from England to continental Europe and across the pond to the Americas. So why did the industrialization begin in England, of all places? Well, in addition to a large population of workers, this, this small island country had extensive natural resources. In order to industrialize, they required natural resources such as water and power to um, fuel those new machines. They needed iron ore to construct the machines and tools and the building of factories, and they needed rivers for inland transportation. They also needed harbors from which the merchants could ship um, their products and their goods out and set sail to other parts of the world. In addition to its natural resources, Britain had an uh, expanding economy, and this was uh, a good support for industrialization. Businessmen um, and business people began to invest in the manufacture of new inventions. Now, Britain's highly developed banking system also contributed to the country's industrialization. People were encouraged by the availability of bank loans to invest in new machinery and to expand their operations. Growing overseas trade, economic prosperity, and climate progress led to the increased demand for goods. Britain's political stability gave the country a tremendous advantage over its neighbors. Though Britain was taking part at that time in many wars during the 1700s, none occurred on British soil. So their military successes gave the British a positive attitude. 
Parliament also passed laws to help encourage and protect business ventures. Other countries had some of these advantages, but Britain had all the factors of production or the resources needed to produce goods and services that the Industrial Revolution required, such as land, labor, capital, and wealth. Or we also um, could add another one, and that's entrepreneurs. So the textile industry was the first one to become um, transformed in an explosion of creativity. Uh, inventions now revolutionized industry. Britain's textile industry clothed the world in wool, linen, and cotton. This industry was the first to be transformed. Cloth merchants uh, boosted their profits by speeding up the process which spinners and weavers made cloth. One invention led to another. In 1733, a machinist named John Kay made a shuttle that sped back and forth on wheels. This flying shuttle doubled the work a weaver could do in a day. Because spinners couldn't keep up with these speedy weavers, a cash prize attracted contestants to produce a better spinning machine. Around 1764, a textile worker named James Hargreaves invented a spinning machine he named after his daughter, Jenny. So his spinning Jenny allowed one spinner to work eight threads at a time. At first, textile workers operated the flying shuttle and the spinning Jenny by hand. Then Richard Arkwright invented the water frame in 1769, and Samuel Compton combined the features of that spinning Jenny and the water frame to produce the spinning mule. The spinning mule made thread that was stronger, finer, and more consistent than earlier spinning machines, and it was run by water power. Edmund Cartwright's power loom sped up weaving after its invention in 1787. Now the water frames, the spinning mule, and the power loom were bulky, and they were expensive machines. They took the work of spinning and weaving out of the home. These cottage industries um, began to fall by the wayside, and wealthy textile merchants set up the machines in large buildings, which they called factories. Factories needed water power, so the first ones were built near rivers and streams. England's cotton came from plantations in, in the American South in the 1700s. Removing seeds from the raw cotton by hand was really hard at work, and in 1793, an American inventor named Eli Whitney invented a machine to speed the chore. His cotton gin multiplied the amount of cotton that could be cleaned. American cotton production skyrocketed from 1. million pounds in 1790 to 85 million pounds in 1810. Progress in the textile industry spurred other industrial improvements. The first was the steam engine, invented by James Watt, a mathematical instrument maker at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. He thought about the problem for two years, and in 1765, Watt figured out a way to make the steam engine work faster and more efficiently while burning less fuel. In 1774, Watt joined with a businessman named Matthew Bolton. He was an entrepreneur. Now, an entrepreneur is a person who organizes, manages, and takes on the risk of the business. He paid Watt a salary and encouraged him to build better machines. Steam could also propel boats. An American inventor named Robert Fulton ordered a steam engine from Bolton and Watt, and he built a steamboat called the Clermont, which made its first successful trip in 1807. The Clermont later ferried passengers up and down the New York Hudson's River. In England, water transportation improved with the creation of a network of canals or human-made waterways. By the mid-1800s, 4,250 miles of inland um, channels uh, slashed the cost of transporting both raw materials and finished goods. Road transportation changed also. British roads improved, thanks to largely to the efforts of John McAdam, a Scottish engineer. He was working in the 1800s, and McAdam equipped um, roadbeds with a layer of large stones for drainage, and on top he placed a carefully smooth layer of crushed rock. Even in rainy weather, heavy wagons could travel over the McAdam roads without sinking in mud. Private investors formed companies that build roads, built roads and then operated them for profit. People called the new roads turnpikes because travelers had to stop at toll gates to pay tolls before traveling any further on the roads. So this uh, marks this period of time also marks the beginning of the railroad age. Steam driven machinery powered English factories in the late 1700s. A steam engine on wheels, the railroad locomotive drove English industry after 1820. In 1804, an English engineer named Robert 
Trevithick won a bet of several uh, thousand dollars. He did this by hauling 10 tons of iron over nearly 10 miles of track in a steam-driven locomotive. One of these early railroad engineers was, called, was named George Stevenson. He had gained a solid reputation by building some 20 engines for mine operators in northern England. So in 1821, Stevenson began to work on the world's first railroad line. It was to run 27 miles from Yorkshire coalfields to the port of Stockton on the North Sea. In 1825, the railroad opened. It used four locomotives that Stevenson had designed and built. Now, news of this success quickly spread throughout Britain. The entrepreneurs of northern England wanted a railroad line to connect the port of Liverpool with the inland city of Manchester. The track was laid and in 1829 they held contests to choose the best locomotive for use on the new line. Five engines entered the competition. None could compare with the rocket designed by Stevenson and his son. The rocket hauled 13 tons of coal at an unheard of speed of more than 24 miles per hour. The invention and perfection of the locomotive had at least four major effects. First, Railroads spurred industrial growth by giving manufacturers a cheap way to transfer materials and finished products. Second, the railroad boom created hundreds of thousands of new jobs for both railroad workers and miners. These miners provided the iron for the tracks and the coal for the steam. Thirdly, the railroads boosted England's agricultural and fishing industries, which could transport their products to distant cities. And finally, by making travel easier, Railroads encouraged country people to take distant city jobs. Also, railroads lured the city dwellers to resorts in the countryside. Like locomotive racing across the country, the Industrial Revolution brought rapid and unsettling changes to people's lives.